Welcome, everybody. Episode 95, Two Chaps, Many Cultures. We welcome a very good friend of ours, Mithun Ridha, to talk about his journey from India to the hustle-bustle world of mergers, acquisitions, including merging and acquisitioning many, acquisitioning many cultures along the way, and to uh, his journey to where he is today. Stick around. There we are, the three amigos. Hello. <laughs> really Wonderful. Hello, Hello everybody. How are you? Two Two chaps, three chaps, many cultures today on this beautiful Friday. Friday the 13th. Remember the numbers episode we did just recently? You might remember for some cultures today it is a bit weird. And to top it all off, it's in the beautiful year of 2020 that has been treating many of us so well with its um, uncertainties and surprises that it had in store for us. So welcome, everybody. Episode 95. How are you such guys? A, such a Benny year. I'm doing well. And how are you, Matt? Doing? Thank you for joining us. Bonjour. Uh, uh, namaste. Bonjour. How, many, how, many, how, many, how many languages? Namaste. Namaskar. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, like, you know, I, I, I want to be a um, uh, purist. So if I'm a purist, I, I count only the languages that I can speak fluently. And so that is seven. But oh. I do speak some of many other languages, which actually are uh, in my list. So the next language which I would love to speak fluently is Spanish. So that's the next challenge. Oh, OK. So maybe yeah, not no, the three I'm quite disappointed. I'm quite disappointed. Only seven languages. Yeah. I don't know. Only. Yeah. Did we find the Actually, right guest uh, for this episode? It, uh, I'm not sure. It, it, you know, in uh, in India, um, we had a former president who spoke 14 languages. Actually, that was quite inspiring. 14. Yeah. So uh, I'm not even halfway. So. Who was who was that, by the way? Who 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 spoke 14? Um, I think it was, um, um, uh, um, I think Narsima Rao. Oh, okay. Uh, also, right. Atal, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, he also used to speak a lot of languages. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, we have a lot of uh, examples in India where you have uh, people with whom you can speak a lot of languages. But I do have a friend who lives in Luxembourg. He's like my big brother. His name is Prince. So I call him Prince of Luxembourg. And uh, with him, we can speak in six languages between us. So nice. that, that's, uh, I, I think six is a, is a max number of languages, mutual languages can I, that I can find anywhere. Nice. So that's nice. always fantastic because uh, I, I, I strongly believe that uh, the, the language is actually part of your personality. So when you're speaking a language, you become a different uh, person. Actually, you are thinking mm -hmm. in a different way. I think it creates different uh, neural connections in your brain. And uh, you don't think the same way because you don't have the same words. For example, if you, if you don't have a word for something, it might not exist in your imagination. Um, just like, uh, um, you know, people who live uh, more in the snow, they have more cold countries, they have more words for snow. But if you go to uh, south of India, you might have just one word for snow. So, uh, so, 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 uh, so, so it's, it really depends on where you are and uh, the amount of words that you have that creates your visible um visible um your visible world and uh, actually I, I i do remember in india someone it, it was somebody was asking me this question like yeah how uh, if you have someone who has a uh, who's um who's just uh, not able to see who's blind how would you explain to him uh, what is 
Taj Mahal, the beauty of Taj Mahal. So it's absolutely difficult to explain because if you don't have something uh, with which you can compare. And I think language, words, they give us more definitions. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that, Brett? Mm -hmm. You also Beautiful. speak so many languages. No, I don't know. I, I just I just have the English and, uh, you know, maybe a, a fairly good grasp of Polish at the moment. But I, th I think I agree with you. And we often talk about, uh, so you grew up, you know, I mean, in terms of your story, and we'll take this back to the language because you grew up, uh, you have a, a, a fascinating story throughout your whole life, but you grew up in India, obviously. But um, you, you it, it is the experience of you and being exposed to languages that kind of led you to become what you call yourself an enthusiastic interculturalist, um, which is which I think is fantastic. Um, and it's probably something that we all share. But tell us about that, that, that uh, I guess, initial exposure and your experience growing up in India and how the expectations of your parents brought you to where you are today. Yeah, I, I think that's a, I, I got exposure to different uh, places very early because my dad uh, had a job which was more transferable. So you would be transferred to a different part of the country every few years. And actually, India being a big country, so it's almost like many countries. So if you if you change the state, you have a different language. Um, people even say that uh, if you uh, uh, go uh, 100 kilometers, you have a different accent. Every 100 kilometers, you find a different dialect. So you can imagine like if you if you are in a different state, you might not be able to read what's written. So you're completely lost. There are places where uh, in India I've been, uh, I can't speak their lo local language. They don't speak the regional languages that I speak. So we end up speaking in English. And even that doesn't go on very well because uh, nobody really speaks English in the small villages. So so I, I, I was confronted to this kind of situation, like uh, not able to understand anything. So for example, I was born in Bengal. So my parents they speak bengali or bangla as their first language so uh, i was uh, I, I learned that in, in my kindergarten that i did in calcutta and after that my parents uh, moved to assam so i was hardly five year old uh, and assam is a wonderful place it's in the northeastern part of india so it's really and that place is called digboy so it's the first oil refinery of India, and it's not very far from the boundary uh, with Myanmar or Burma. So uh, there, uh, when we moved there, I was exposed to the national language Hindi because in 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 Bengal, when I was growing up, although people speak Hindi, but in the day day to day uh, uh, conversations, they only speak in Bangla. So I I was like uh, I was listening to one word all the time and i felt like it's very funny very funny and i i would uh, i would keep uh, go out play with the other kids and uh i would laugh about this thing and i would like i would break my head about this word it was called kana kana what does it mean kana and it uh, i mean like after so many days i mean it uh I feel I, I've been uh, exposed so uh, well to, to, to that Hindi speaking environment in, in, in that city uh, that I, I learned it so fast. It was like within two weeks, I could already speak bits of uh, bits of uh, I could express myself for the basic things. And I think uh, uh, I think it took me just a couple of months to speak it fluently. So I even today, I feel like I don't know how I learned one language so quickly and it took me a few days to understand the word kana and actually it means food <laughs> 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 so um uh, i think it's uh, i think learning languages uh, is accelerated when you are in a in an environment when you have no one who speaks your language and that's uh, mm -hmm. some people take it uh, as a barrier or as a challenge for me i think it's an accelerator because it's uh, it's an amazing opportunity that you have got to learn today in paris i, I have uh, a lot of friends who just say like proudly expats and they say probably like i don't speak french i mean like i see like oh come on uh 
you had been given a fantastic opportunity to learn this language. You're living here, you, everything uh, around you is in French. You, you should be learning from this environment and grasping like a sponge and learning it and mm. like be fluent as soon as you can be. So uh, I, I got curious uh, with that experience at the age of five. So I lived in Assam for a couple of years. Uh, and I don't know if you know Assam, if, you're, if you love tea, people say, oh, even I would say the people in England say that that's the best tea in the world. So let me say, let me do some indirect uh, promotion for this tea. So the Assam tea <laughs> uh, and the tea from Darjeeling. So those are the two very famous teas from India. So I was actually lived, my school was in the middle of tea gardens. So my, my oh, wow. school had a playground. It was on the top of a hill. And uh, the hill uh, and the name of the school was Playground School. So we had a playground. Uh, we would study, but we would play a lot. And around the uh, playground, all you could see, as far as you could see, were tea gardens with women with that big basket in their back. And sometimes they were carrying the kids. So the kid would be attached with the cloth to their bodies and they would be plucking the the uh, they would be plucking those uh, fine leaves the young leaves the green leaves that become later the green tea so uh, seeing those gardens it's it's really soothing and uh, mm -hmm. since then whenever i go to a to a place uh, where you have the um, these tea gardens it's it's absolutely a wonderful uh, feeling because at that age, I did not have tea. And today I'm a big fan of tea and I, I collect tea. I have always like a tea from at least 15 to 20 countries at all times. So um, I think uh, it stuck to me from those days in mm -hmm. Assam. So, um, and my, my parents were uh, very ambitious. So ambitious means, I think uh, it's, a, it's a common thing for all Indian parents. I think our Asian parents are extremely ambitious. And so, um, like, for uh, I, I had a record in my primary school for, for like five consecutive years. I used to be the first, so I was always first in class. I, I had the rank one, and that was like a really uh, got me into trouble as well. Like, there were a few girls who used to be like first and second, and since the moment I joined the school, I replaced them as first, and they would like hate me. Even today, after all these years, they would not speak to me because they still hate me because I took their number one position. And uh, so all those years when I had the rank one, I would come home with my uh, report card and I would show it to my dad. And I'm like, I would show it like, hey, look, I got uh, the f I'm first again. And the response would be uh, not like congratulations. Hey, you did a great job or something. I think culturally in, in the USA, <laughs> you would at least um, say something positive. And that was n not at all the reaction I would have. I would say, hey, how much did you get in maths? You got 85, uh, why didn't you get 99? I would say mm. like, hey, look, I, I got the highest, I'm the number one. No, why didn't you get 99? So that was the level. Mm. So it was like uh, never uh, something enough. But at the same time, uh, with the ambition, my parents were like always, uh, very ambitious at the same time, they wanted always the best for me. And that meant a lot of, uh, a lot of um, 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 uh, discipline on their mm -hmm. behalf, a lot of uh, challenge and a lot of sacrifice. It means like uh, there were times like they would sacrifice their own wants, own needs for me. Because that would be like, uh, I, I would always have a birthday party. Now, how many of you have uh, seen birthday parties where you have at least 500 people invited for dinner? Of course. So my, 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 average, every year. Uh, <laughs> my, my average, average birthday party was, was uh, like that. At least 400 to 500 people invited. There would be even a, a whole stage and... Uh, uh, place like uh, built in their in our, in our big garden. There was a catering. They would have the food and everything. So that was a lot of things. And like uh, and 
uh, my birthday is on 5th of July. So what happens on 5th of July, especially in Bombay where I grew up, because after Assam, my parents moved to Bombay. And in Bombay, 5th of July is really the, I don't know why, but every year there's something magical about this day. It's the most rainy day in the month of July. And that's always my birthday. And that's one of the reasons out of those 500 people invited, there were always 30 to 40 percent of the invitees who would just miss it because when it rains yeah. in india it's not like just any normal rain you take all the rain that happens here uh during months it might fall just in one evening so that's the kind of like right. big drops you within a few seconds you're completely drenched in the water so that will uh, so people just would stay in and i would i would feel uh uh completely um uh, very very disappointed because hey this guy this person this family didn't come hey why didn't they come and uh today in france when i uh, when i tell people that my birthday is on 5th july again everyone says feels like sorry for me hey it's during the vacation sorry when you will be celebrating your birthday nobody would be around so i think like the reason is always the same a big part of the people won't be around because they would be well but, um, Mithun, I have to, or I want to, to put this into context when you say about 20, 30 percent did not show up because of the heavy rains, that 500 people invited, that still means that 350 people did show up, right? Of course. <laughs> and that's why, like, oh, okay. and that, after that, and that was a very interesting day for me because after that day, I would spend at least two to three days uh, unwrapping the gifts. And my first, uh, um, um, my first interest in different cultures actually came from one of those birthday gifts I got at the age of five. And one of the birthday gifts was a game, a quiz game, where you had a uh, name of countries on one side, and on the other side, you had the capitals or the currencies or the flags. And you just had to, you had a wire, and you had to point it on the, on the question, and then like let's say you have Japan on one side, then you have the list of capitals. If you touch the uh, the pointer on Tokyo, then the light will blink. And that will like, uh, I, I, I was so amazed with that game that I kept playing it for days uh, until I knew everything by heart. So I, I, I knew like uh, the capitals of more than 50 countries by heart, uh, currencies of more than 50 countries, capitals, languages, um uh and uh well, also the let's geography. put you to so, the test then so what is the capital of suriname <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding i'm sure he knows it <laughs> but um, <laughs> what what, what, what would be because you already alluded to it you you now live in paris so you're you're in the heart of europe and I hear a lot of comparisons when people try to explain India to Westerners. I often hear that comparison. India is almost like the European Union. It's um, it's many countries on one continent or on the subcontinent. Now, you've been living in the European Union for a while, Mitan. Would that be a fair comparison, do you think, the European Union as a multicultural, multilingual continent compares to India? Is, is that... Or is that going too far uh, i think uh, there are things which are common for example uh, the fact that uh, the countries the borders these are very recent um mm -hmm. in the past it was uh, they were the borders kept changing i think you have a time graphic you can check on uh, on google that shows how the borders changed over the last 2000 years and it's really, really, really interesting to see that. And I think that's the same thing in India. So the, those mm -hmm. borders of the states, the, the regional identity in each state that you have today, that didn't exist before. So mm -hmm. what was more stronger is the language. So actually, um, uh, and that's why like in India, you, uh, you, you identify the, the, the adjective for uh, naming a person where he, come, he or she comes from is actually based on the language and not on the name of the state. For example, uh, I'll take a state in, uh, in the Western India, Maharashtra. Okay, so Maharashtra is one of the largest states in India. The capital is Mumbai. Now, if you are from Maharashtra, 
in in any Indian language, you you will not say I'm a Maharashtrian. In English, you might be able to say it, but you more you yeah, say I'm, I am Marathi. Exactly. So yeah. Marathi yeah. is actually the language. So you ident right. you have an identification. You identify yourself with the language and not with mm -hmm. the name of the state or with not with the geo geography. Uh, same mm -hmm. if somebody is from Karnataka, uh, they will identify themselves as Kannada because Kannada mm -hmm. is the language. Uh, right. Bengali because uh, Bangla is the language, um, uh, and so on. So 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 I think I think I think that's the part which is common. Uh, mm -hmm. Other things which are common is a diversity in the in the um, um, um in your religions so in europe you have this diversity in india you do have this diversity um lots of other common things lots of different political opinions uh pe lots of mixes it means people from one region moving to another region so you have you have people moving within india uh, a lot so i think i i feel uh, a lot of comparisons uh yeah which are quite similarities i would say but what makes it different is that um still um there is a very big uh common uh feeling in india which is more it's it's very family oriented and it's very much group oriented culture and i think that's extremely strong and very traditional and uh, that's what makes the culture very different um uh even if uh there was a long period of colonialization for which lasted almost more than 200 years in certain parts of india you still have um this strong uh, reg uh, regional cultural identity which which didn't go which didn't uh, get lost in, in, in during those periods of colonization and i think that's people that what's uh, that's what make people very proud and uh, it sometimes goes over the context and that also creates uh, a dispute so i think uh, i think uh, i think the numbers are much larger in india you have more than 1.3 billion people so everything is accelerated it's more complex it's more complicated everything is written but things which are written is not always followed. So that's also like uh, you have the most rules, but rules are there not to be followed, but you should know the rules so that you can break them someday. So um, <laughs> you- uh, I kind of like that approach though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, I do want to make it a, I do want to include a, a, a 2020 type question. And this is, forgive me, um, a very North American perspective that I'm taking here, but it, I think to a certain degree, it has also become a European perspective. You're being a person of color, at least that's what the what society um, issues as a label for you, whether you want it or not. Um, and you live in Europe and probably in arguably one of the most diverse countries in Europe and France. And We've had a lot of conversations, not only in North America, but also in many European countries this year with um, uh, inequality uh, along ethnic lines and socioeconomic lines. What is it like from your perspective to be a, if I may say so, a person of color in Europe? How, how is your experience? How would you describe that? I feel, um, I feel uh, a lot depends on how you feel inside yourself the way you feel from the inside uh, that really changes your perspective that your uh, that also changes your perception of others if you feel i'm not from here i'm a different uh and if you, you you might have one of the two complexes you might have a superiority complex or you might have an inferiority mm. complex because you are from one place to another so uh some people so so there might be some people so i do i do have a uh, an indian friend uh whom i cannot name who had a, a very high superiority complex so the moment he came to france for the first few years ah i'm not like this you know these people they eat beef so they it means they are impure 
uh, or uh, it's like uh, they're committing a sin, although this is a sin only for Hindus and not for somebody else. But actually, he had this, um, um, this so-called view of looking at life, which was so, so uh, different. And he did not change that. He kept on imposing uh, his rules, which he had within him, to see uh, his identity. I think over time, he learned it. And he's a very different person now, after uh, being in France for over 10 years now. And he speaks fluent French. He's very well adapted. So a lot of changes I see. But for the first few years, I always saw him struggling. So I think that's the kind of thing. If you come with a superiority complex or an inferiority complex, you're always comparing others to yourself. You are looking at things. You feel like others are more privileged. You are not privileged. or uh, other uh, the other vice versa would be i am superior to the others that are around me here so i i i i expect things like i have a uh, i can order i i am like a star I, I i people should treat me on a pedestal so that's kind of all the uh, i might be exaggerating but those are the feelings that goes inside you but as mm. the moment when you think go further into your own awareness of your own self. And if you go beyond everything which is superficial, what you see, like the skin, the way you look, the, uh, the, the way you are dressed, or uh, the way uh, the, your age, your gender. And if you go beyond all this, I think, uh, I think um, you'll realize that we are all very, very same. We have the same uh, physiological needs. We have the same emotional needs. We are we are very much same. Uh, we are built out of the same elements, and I think uh, in India we we say that we are everything is from five elements, and uh, so we are built from the same elements. We came from nature. We are part of the nature, and will die, and will become again part of the same mother nature. And I I I always believed it very strongly, and that's why I felt at the beginning some. Uh, some uh, kind of hesitation. I used to feel that I'm different at the beginning. When I when I came for the first year, I would see people reacting in different ways. So I would say like, "Hey, they are different. They're not. Uh, they're they're like this. They're not doing the things my way." So uh, I was I was uh, challenged, and I also forced myself that I should not stay in a bubble of Indian friends. Also, I did not have a uh, a lot of choice in in the business school where I was studying in Angers in France. There was uh, one senior. Uh, her name is Radhika. So she was um, she was the only other Indian I knew in that city. So that makes things very easy. I did not have a lot of people from my own country to meet, and that makes it uh, that kind of pushes you to to go beyond and and look and meet other people. So I I I, I did that. So I think my uh, um, inner journey has been uh, full of exploration. I have been exploring and I'm exploring more. And the more I explore, the more I feel connected to other people. So I think at the beginning, I was not feeling very much co uh, connected. I used to feel I'm different. I look different. Uh, and uh, of course, sometimes those feelings like uh, if somebody is responding not in the way that you have been expecting. You feel that maybe because I'm, my color is different. You, you have those mm -hmm. things like uh, inferiority, or you might think about that. Um, and that, that might be the case. But, um, but over time, I think I, I feel more and more uh, integrated with the people because I, I think it was also quite linked to the language. Like I did do my homework before coming to Europe. So I learned French and German both at the same time in India. So when I came here, I could speak, I could understand French, I could speak French, but my French was not that fluent. So it means like I could understand everything somebody said to me, but I could not respond. But uh, it took me a couple of years to understand the, the fine jokes, the, the context of the jokes. And so the more I, more time I had, the more I could understand what people would mean. And the more curious I got over time, I think there are people who might lose their curiosity, but I think I uh, am like, a, like an artist. So somebody said an artist is 
um, a child who decided not to grow up. So I think, uh, <laughs> and uh, so I, I also decided to, to, to keep that curiosity. And one of my favorite speakers, uh, Jim Collins, he says, uh, if, um, if, uh, if I would uh, like an addiction uh, in my life, it would be curiosity. And uh, I, I completely agree. And so the more curio curious I was, I, I kept on exploring this. But at the same time, I, sometimes I had, uh, I went to places where people were not like me and I had, I got some awkward looks. So at the beginning, it felt like, oh, it feels uh, bad or it feels mm -hmm. uh, not comfortable. But later I, I would, uh, as an interculturalist, like I would always think from their way, uh, like, why do you think they might be looking at me like that? So maybe, yeah, maybe like, you know, I'm the most uh, different uh, creature on earth who came here at this point of time. So let me let me let me make their life easy. Let me introduce myself and let me start a conversation. I think uh, I think before the moment you speak the the time you take to just observe and make an idea and a stereotype in your mind your stereotypes keep on adding one above the other they're like organic and you create a whole burden on your shoulders you create and those are all full of misconceptions mm -hmm. and i think uh, if you have one right line of connection where you start talking all those bubbles, balloons of misconceptions, they burst in a second. And I think that's what happened uh, a lot of times. And I, I feel uh, really happy. So I, uh, I did have those awkward moments when I used to question myself. I used to question this difference. I used to question this fact of being a person of color. And uh, at the same time, um, I take the more uh, the, the amount of people who are so close to me, to, to my parents, and the number of my European friends who took time to visit me and my parents in India is so, there's so many of my dear friends. I'm so thankful to them that all this makes it look so much that we are connected and we are like part of the same family. And that's what I feel. Um, and I think, I think that's, that's the way, that's the direction in which I'm going. So I feel my message for other people in that to have the self doubt, to have those questions is normal because uh, human brain is designed in a way to think more negatively. So 70% of the times you have negative thoughts. So it's, it's normal to think that things are wrong that there is different that difference is bad i like your approach because it is it, it it reminds the individual who is entering the foreign space that it's their obligation to look for connection everybody exactly. else is already connected in some shape or form but the newcomer is not as connected yet so it is upon the visitor to the new environment to to look for belonging and i'm not saying it's easy and I've, if i listen to you correctly in certain locations it took you some time because you had to uh, improve your language skills and i would suspect that speaking german to people in paris or in Angers didn't help much so you had to, you had, you, 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 you had to improve your french quickly uh, yeah, now, it's, it's, um, uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, interesting how, how it goes over time. But I think, I think language is really, uh, really important. And especially the fact that humor is part of our life. If you don't understand humor in a, in a, in a foreign language, it cuts you off from the rest of the people. I think humor is, is, a, is a sign of connection. It is, well, but it's, it's it, incredibly it, it, hard to master that. I, I, I remember vividly how my humor failed me abroad or how, how long it took me to understand the humor of the environment that I'm in. To give you an example, Brett and I, we've known each other for years. Sometimes he cracks jokes and I simply don't understand what he's saying. Obviously, he thinks he's hilarious. I don't understand it. I, I'm, so, I'm, I'm being the... Yeah. No, think about it, dude. I'm hilarious. You just don't get it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what it is. That's what it is. 
so I have to ask yeah. for, but th that, that, that increases this feeling, oh, oh dang it, I don't belong here. I, I, I struggle understanding this humor. Will I ever understand? Will I ever feel that connection? And at some point, you, if, if you're the, the, the one loner, the one outsider in a group, it becomes, you feel like it becomes a burden to ask for clarification. Can you explain your humor to me? I would like to laugh with you because if I can laugh with you, then I feel that I'm a part of your group. But if I have to ask for this all the time, at some point, it, it's a constant ding on my on my confidence, right? So it, exactly. humor is, is a great tool, but it is also a tool that takes a while to master if you're doing it across cultures. Absolutely. This, it's and though, that, I, that I just want to bring back this because this is this is a point. I deploy this humor with Christian uh, intentionally because I know mm -hmm. he does ask me about it. And it, it, it's kind of a prompt for me because there's a real genuine interest in some. It's like you talk about, Matun, about the curiosity, the, the just passionate curiosity that I know that if I deploy this humor in a place, like in normal business settings in the US here, there's a lot of just kind of questioning, polite misunderstanding, but no, there's, there's not a lot of curiosity. There's just like, oh, well, it must be something silly I don't understand. Yeah, I, I think, I I think about, um, what I love about Christian's approach hmm. is he actually, I know he's going to ask me. And this is, this might sound strange. I know, you know, maybe in subconsciously, he asked me because he's very curious. He, he brings a lot of curiosity to everything. And, and I, and I go, well, this is great. This is a chance for me to kind of sometimes maybe bamboozle. And, you know, and, and yes, I may make, I may make, I, make I, 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 I think, uh, I, I think um, it's, um, it, it, you, you can have a, lots of different kinds of humor, but the, the humor that doesn't work with people from another culture or the humor that works with people from another culture. And, and the, the humor that doesn't work is uh, the humor when it's extremely context based. Like, suppose mm -hmm. I, I say something which is right. from a soap. Uh, opera from the 1960s and the people other people cannot uh, understand uh, it's my problem I chose the wrong uh, humor but you can the, the the good thing about the humor is that the principle is the same the technique is the same it's like your 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 you have a train of ideas and your train has a fixed direction it has a destination it's on the track it's going in one direction and at some point of time you just make the train get derailed out of the tracks to a place where people never expected things would become and that's what makes it funny and uh, one of my friends she she even did a research on humor and so the relationship between the humor and the psychological aspects of humor and actually she said that humor in, in in at the beginning for the brain it's actually a sign it's a symbol of danger and it's a kind of a discontinuity that when we laugh actually this humor is it's because uh, it's to relax the mind because right. that's the danger has been avoided and so if mm -hmm. that is the the the, the basic uh, the, the the scientific link so we when we know that that is the, the 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 golden principle or the golden logic of getting a laugh? I think you can get a laugh anywhere. Um, and I've seen people. I I have met people with whom I had absolutely no way of communicating. So I have a friend. Uh, his name is Michel. He lives in Lyon, not in Lyon exactly, but uh, like uh, forty minutes from Lyon in a small town called Trevoux. And Michelle is like one of the funniest people in my life. It's like a way when with him, we, we traveled to India. We traveled uh, with other friends to a wedding in Azerbaijan, to the wedding of my friend Cyril and uh, Ismer. And at that wedding, uh, Michelle uh, and I, we met people. So the, 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 all the invitees, the kids from Azerbaijan and we did not speak the language so they were they were, did not speak english we did not speak russian um and uh, so we, there was no way to communicate and actually michelle was the first person who made them laugh and that was the first communication then we did other things that we were not supposed to do uh, people said like okay you know stay there you're not from that culture don't talk to the people don't talk to the women don't do this don't do that and actually with Michelle, this is what we do always. Like we never follow any of the rules. 
know the rules because you want to break them at some time. And so what we did is we we started uh talking to the people although they did not understand but somehow with the gestures with the body language we made them laugh and uh when they were dancing the, the traditional dance actually uh i managed to get the steps right and then michelle as well and we were dancing with the people on the in the traditional uh dance and actually they were all smiling they were all wanting to communicate and talk with us Although we did not have the common language, but sometimes you know you don't need words to communicate the emotions. But, but there's okay, there's but one critical sorry. piece in this. I think there's sorry, one sorry. critical. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say here's a, here's an example. We don't need words. Patricia on Facebook says wine. We can understand each other with wine. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. Of course, yeah. <laughs> sorry to interrupt. Uh, actually, uh, I think um, uh, um, I, I can only quote Ernest Hemingway. Wine is the most um, and um, wine is the most uh, um, not uh, not say knowledge. I'm uh, forgetting it. Um, um, it you. you say it in French. Yeah. Maybe maybe you'll remember it in French. It's something it, on the same lines. Like uh, wine is the most sophisticated or knowledgeable thing uh, you can have. So. Uh, I, um, I I really like this idea of wine being such a sophisticated thing in life. And yes, of course, it's it's made with passion. It it mm. connects people like a smile. Um, I mean, like when you're drinking with someone, it just means that like yeah, you know, you're sharing a moment of your life after your whole day of work. That's your personal time. You are taking this part of your life and you're sharing with someone. And also that. Uh, like there are cultures where it's it's considered that when you're drinking with someone, like in China, you're drinking with someone, and if you're like even going to the extent of like being drunk, I, I mean, like I don't, I don't say that you should get drunk, but the thing is the fact that you're risking it to get drunk in the company of someone you don't know that well just means that you trust them so much that you're you're willing to get drunk. So I think I think I think uh, I think uh, it's it's a part of the dialogue. It creates dialogues. It, things you do uh, create make a bridge. So, like I've seen, like people who smoke. Or I don't smoke, but I have colleagues who smoke. So they are ready to walk for ten minutes from their uh, office to go outside the building to be able to smoke. But that's the standard they have for themselves. Their standard is like they smoke. They like smoking. They want to go and 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 the people, the other people who. I used to feel at the beginning of my career, all these people who smoke every half an hour or every hour, what a waste of time. Later did I understand lots of business gets done during those smoke moments. And uh, the, the, that's a completely different group. I did try smoking with them for some time and I, I, I saw those discussions and then I, I, I realized soon that was not the thing for me, but I do understand that that creates a, a medium for for understanding it's a bridge yeah you had something the, the, to say the the, 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 the the bridge uh, or one one important pillar of that bridge that you're describing from the example earlier when you were in Azerbaijan and and dancing with the locals i think one critical piece here is not being afraid of one's embarrassment having the humility and the vulnerability to make a fool of yourself. You said Absolutely. know the rule, know the rule so you know which one you can break. That can be a very tight rope to walk and it may lead to you being the laughing stock. It may it may expose you to ridicule or even worse to some kind of other repercussions. But venturing out on that on that wiggly branch and, and, and waiting to see whether you'll break or not. That vulnerability piece is critical. And too often, how many of us, and I'm, I include myself in this, how often do we play it safe rather than risking something? Because playing safe is comfortable. It will not, it will not challenge us. And, and I will be, I'll be kept whole and nobody's laughing about me, or I don't feel like I, I made uh, made myself an idiot but being vulnerable to venture out and do something that will break the rules or where you don't even know if it does break a rule that you're not even aware of you just do without 
with, with, without knowing what the risks are and still doing it. This is, I think, in any intercultural interaction, a critical piece of build-up risk. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I, think, I, I think you can always play safe. But what's the risk of playing safe? You know, you're all yeah. losing this, all these possible connections with right. people. Right. And, and uh, you could be a snob. Sometimes I say that, okay, I live in Paris, so uh, I have every, uh, I have, uh, I have picked things from being a Parisian. What do you do when you're traveling? Have a book uh, in your hand, have your headphones, you're listening to your music, you're completely disconnecting from the people outside you. And uh, um, I used to live in uh, Brussels. And when I go back to Brussels now, I'm so attached to my Parisian habits that by default, I have my headphones and the novel. And it's, it's so uh, awkward feeling I get when I'm in the metro in Brussels. When I look around after some time, I feel like some people are looking at me a bit with bizarre eyes because I'm the only person in the whole metro uh wearing headphones and reading a book because other people there there are people who talk to each other and uh, i then i remembered ah yes when i used to live there 10 years back uh things were different i used to speak to people like uh, uh, uh once I, I i got a gift uh in those days so that was the year 2010 i got a the uh, the biography okay of a political leader uh so now she's so famous so um, I was reading it in German, and that was a biography of Angela Merkel. And mm. I was reading that in a train, and uh, that generated some kind of curiosity. So first, like, I look Indian, but I'm reading a book, and which is very specific. It's a geopolitical book. It's a biography of this politician. And um, uh, so uh, there was a German guy uh, in front of me who saw it, and he started speaking and then we had a good discussion. He said like, you know what? I thought you were, you, you are born in Germany. I said, no, 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 I was, I got it as a gift. And, uh, and that, that moment he risked it. Um, so, uh, and then the same evening, I see the same person and we, we just, we were taking the same train to come back to Brussels. And then we had a discussion. We said like, okay, this is too much of coincidence. Let's go and have a drink. And so with this person, his name is Peter, uh, we go for a drink and that starts, uh, that was the beginning of a journey. Later we became flatmates, the last, and then I was at their wedding. Uh, he's one of my closest friends. And the last time I told you, Brett, when I went to Poland, uh, that was for uh, the christening of his daughter. So, uh, you know, like the whole, all this experience, just because of that book I was reading, just that made of Angela Merkel. Curious. Uh, Angela Merkel is schuld on deine Freundschaft. All oh, right, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I'm just saying, like, if I, I didn't talk, I was reading the book. But if Peter did not take that first move of, like, being curious, taking the risk and, like, hey, interrupting, hey, you're reading this book. I'm interested to know about you because just you're reading a book uh, in German. I and and that just generated curiosity. And I think I think that curiosity might might uh, might bring you might bring you to different places, different destination, different roads. And that's uh, that's the way. I mean, like these are uh, the the um, the ways to access the treasures of life. So if you're not taking those moments to access the treasure, I mean, you can just have a very boring life. And uh, let, let like this a... be the message for the weekend, people. Let your <laughs> curiosity take you on the road that will take you to the treasures of life. Without curiosity, you won't be on that road. I'm, I'm paraphrasing what you said, me too. Um, I love it. I love it. Be curious, people. It's Friday. Go curious into your weekends. Absolutely. Thank you, Mithun, so, so much uh, to, for jumping on. Very kind of last minute. I just pinged Mithun this morning. I thought, well, you've probably got nothing better to do, Mithun. You're sitting around, <laughs> you're, you're quaffing wine. You're probably, you know, you're probably at one of your money, many 20 teas or something like that. Uh, why not come and join us? And we're very happy you did. Thank you for sharing 
uh, your your I mean just a little bit of your story. I think this is great. I I would I I love talking to the Mattoon all the time. There's so so many different aspects of it. So thank you so much, and thank you everybody. Um, thank you to today to we had uh, we had Patricia on, of course. It was always pretty much on, and uh, Yuko. Um, they both say you know both French speakers, obviously, and. Um, and for sharing your comments, if you're watching the replay, put your comments and uh, and get in contact with Matu and he's uh, available on LinkedIn. And yes, have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Episode 95, Two Chaps, Many Cultures. And uh, we will see you next week. A bientôt. Merci beaucoup. Merci. See you again, Alvida. <laughs> <laughs>